Many thanks for staying with us here on Journeys to our first story. And minority leader in parliament, Oseche Mensa Bonso, is accusing government of rushing through an electrification deal involving Smarties production through parliament. Now, according to the minority leader, Selassie Brahim's Smarties company is fronting for a Chinese firm that has been awarded a contract amounting to about $98 million. Smarties Productions is the same company that was involved in the controversial bus branding that cost the nation about 3.6 million cities. So, Sergei Menzimoso has been telling us much more on this issue. He spoke earlier on News Desk. At the time when uh, Mr. came before us, the Smarties had come under the government uh, because of their dealings or their involvement in the rebranding of the 115 metro mass transit buses. And the matter had not been concluded. And I thought it was unconscionable as a nation, whilst we had not dealt with it decisively, to allow parties to front for another Chinese company and be giving a, a contract to the tune of $98 million. Forget that as a nation, when one of our own, Zoom Lion, was involved in the contract and the World Bank, after filing to it, felt that um, the contract sum had been padded. We blacklisted Zoom Lion from operating in Liberia until they paid themselves and took about two years. So I thought in Ghana, we should demonstrate seriousness with our world of contracts once it involved a company that was being discussed and whose business had not been concluded to be given another another such reward. Uh, I saw the report from the committee that was tasked to delve into it, and they had not served members of parliament with copies of the report, of, of the contract. The contract went the contract document went to the uh, the committee. And the committee is not parliament, you know, committee, the committee acts on behalf of parliament. Yeah. The committee itself is not parliament. So it's important that that contract are uh, given to all members of parliament so that they could peruse it and give some people, even outside parliament, to advise them on it before we come to consider it with, with, with a magnifying glass. Because, as I said, I'm, I'm not too sure that if the nation uh, was a serious nation. A, a, a company is involved in some fraudulent deal. And when you have not dealt with it, you, you allow the company to front for another, comp another, another group to uh, you know, secure um, a contract. I'm not too sure that any serious nation will do that. Meanwhile, Communications Minister Edward Omane Boama has refuted the claims by the minority leader challenging him to come forward with evidence of impropriety in the electrification project. I think that it is important that Honorable Seche Mesa is fair to every Ghanaian by indicating if he has strong suspicion or strong evidence of an impropriety, it would be better for him to put that out with the exact particulars rather than extrapolating i am very happy that under the ndc rural electrification projects are taking through value for money audits and let me indicate here also that value for money audits are not done for free in fact if you talk to companies like price waterhouse coopers companies like Ensign Young, companies, several others who do some of these value for money audits. They are most of the time a certain percentage of the quantum of the contract. They are very expensive. Is it the case that as a nation, we want to spend money upon money upon money on value for money audit. I'll or come to the value the for campaign. money bit. Doc, if you just permit me to take you back, my substantive question was about uh, whether or not 
you from the executive government point of view don't see it as necessary especially against the background that this company has been involved in a prior deal that has had issues with it let me give you an example the world bank uh you know looked at a number of companies including one company from ghana i think it's a matter of public record i can mention the name zoom lion and said they have been involved in a particular deal that had something untoward with it and therefore they were bad moving forward for a period from participating in any other world bank contract the whole argument is that if the fingers have been sold in prior engagement, you want to take a second look. You don't think that's a justifiable argument for which reason this should have been looked at again? I do not think that is the exact argument Honorable Secretary Abunzu is making. The argument that he makes has to do with the fact that B is following A. And so necessarily there must be something in there. I don't think this is how we should proceed. Okay, let me come I to the will, value. I will, I will, I will strongly, strongly, strongly suggest that if the honorable minority leader has strong evidence of impropriety, I would urge him to put it out. Doc, my final question to you. Was this contract so sourced or it went through competitive bidding? Do you know? I would have to check with the Ministry of Power. And that was Communications Minister Edward Omanebwama speaking to uh, Kujo Ponkoma on the Super Morning Show earlier today. But away from that, and the owner of a quarry site in Piabo in the Eastern Region is denying responsibility for the explosion which killed one person and injured 10 others last week. Now, most of those injured have since been discharged from hospital, but the town remains devastated with many houses destroyed by the force of the explosion. The owner of the quarry, which has not been operational for almost four years to join news that his company will do its best to compensate those who are affected. What I know is that Piabo as a company, since more than four years, has never used explosives. There is another company called AKY Mining, who is a licensed explosive dealer, and they store explosives within the premises of Piabo Quarry. So you are the owner of Piabo Quarry? I'm the owner of Piabo Quarry. Okay. So on the day of the explosion, where were you? I was in Accra. Okay. Going after certain transactions with our bankers and so on. So I was not even at the quarry at all. Okay. So how come explosives found their way into your quarry? That's what I'm saying. There is a magazine which is operated by AKY Mining. And AKY Mining is a licensed explosive dealer. So they can explain any further questions. But of course, if you say AKY Mining mm. deals with explosives, this is your quarry. Yes. The explosives were in your quarry. Was there a planned explosion that, and it happened that Not way? at all. Not at all. AKY Mining sells explosives from this magazine to quarry operators. So it's not that uh, we were making any blast or anything. Okay. So you are the owner of the mine. Yes. I mean, considering the kind of damage that has been caused, a, a life has been lost, several other people have been injured, what do you make of what happened at your premises and the lives we've lost as a result of it? It's a very sad issue. But all I can say is that this is a problem which we have rather been making the authorities aware that the encroachments that are going on can lead to such unwarranted issues. So you're saying for the science that you have, the concession you have, yes. these people are complaining because they have wrongfully encroached on your land and that's why the explosion affected them? I would say that this particular explosion is an accident, a very big accident. So it might have gone beyond the normal quarry operation issues. So I cannot answer that question at the moment. But so far as a quarry, the normal quarry operation is concerned, those people, some of those people have encroached. Mind you, it is said that there was a first explosion and actually those who got hurt and those who died went to see the explosion and then there was a second explosion. Is that what usually happens, that in the process of explosion, the, the first one goes over and then the second goes Not at off. all. Not at all. These are some of the issues which the police are investigating. Normally, if there is a first explosion, that will be it. Will it be fair to anyone who says that you are to be held responsible for this? It's not fair. 
First, we have not used any explosives. And secondly, the AKY mining is a licensed explosive dealer. So the, one has to investigate why such an explosion could even happen. Okay. You keep harping on AKY mining being a licensed explosive dealer. Yes. Yes. Are they the ones who deal with explosions in your quarry? Yes. They are the ones who deal there because they sell it to other quarries, okay. not only to us. And they are also supervised by the police at any given time. So at any point in time, if there are questions about who we should hold responsible, mm. it should be AKY mining and not UPI quarry? Yes, AKY mining. Because we, we don't have anything to do with the explosives. And I think they are available for questions. So for anyone who's home and for those who are in these communities who are watching right now mm. and are asking themselves, you are absolving yourself of blame, but is that really what it is? That is really what it is. Why, and, and why, them, why should we believe that? Yeah, because that is what it is. Anybody who holds uh, an explosive dealership, licensed explosive dealership, is responsible for his actions, like any company who acts or this acts. But what I'm saying is that what happened is an accident which should be investigated as such. Okay. People have lost lives. Families yeah. have seen their people yeah. injured. Yeah. Are you doing anything to compensate them? We are talking to the police about that. Because why, why the police? Yeah, because we don't want to do anything directly with the families which could be interpreted as a liability. That is why we want to deal through the police. So your plan is to compensate them? No, no that's not what I'm saying. But we contribute what we think is our social responsibility to the lives that have been affected. Life. Will this in any way influence your future operations in this particular quarry? Definitely, definitely. I mean, such an accident influences whatever one does, and that is what we are What also have you put in place right now? At the moment, we are not even allowed to go and access our losses. We are not allowed to go in, so it means we can't do anything yet. And that's some of the issues. We have not been even allowed in. Why? The police are investigating, so they don't want anybody to go in. I'm listening to you, and you sound very sad. I am. What are you sad about? You see, this is something which maybe could have been avoided. Because this is not the first time. If you recall, about five months ago, there was also an accident in uh, Ablekuma. It wasn't of this magnitude, but also there somebody died. So at least since then, the education should have been that people should keep away from quarries. Because mind you, the person who died, be, died because he wanted to go and see what had happened after the explosion. And this could be avoided. That is why I'm sad. Now away from that, and police in the Volta region are on the manhunt for three suspects behind an attempt to import several cartons of ammunition into Ghana from neighboring Togo. Now, the Aflao Customs Division has intercepted a large amount of shotgun cartridges parked in a compartment created beneath a Nigerian registered cargo truck. The cargo truck containing the parked shotgun cartridges with registration number KTU444D Lagos was intercepted at the Koglo barrier between Denu and Georgia on Sunday. About 99,000 pieces of shotgun cartridges were confiscated, coupled with some 56 parcels of uh, suspected Indian hem and cosmetics. During interrogation, the SEPS officers realized the fictitious compartment was created beneath the truck, hence decided to force it open. The occupants of the truck are still at large. Now, two of us said to be behind the murder of a police constable at Kaswa some weeks ago have been arrested by the Bonohafo Regional Police Command. The two, Kweku Bedu and Ishmael Ahinkra, are said to have been arrested in their hideout in Gosso on Monday, December 28. Correspondent Pressure Simevo has more. Oh, These uh, two people, Kweku Bedu, who is uh, 29, also known as uh, King Kong, and then uh, Ishmael Ahinkra, uh, 19. Uh, were, you know, believed to have been involved uh, during the killing of uh, one constable, Prince Akata, uh, somewhere near Weja in Kaswa. 
and uh, they have been on the on the run out uh, for some time for some months now. I must say, and uh, the police, uh, both Central Region Greater Accra and then the Bonga Hapo Region, as well as all the other regional uh, commanders, have been on the lookout for these uh, two uh, criminals. But uh, luck eluded them uh, when, upon a tip of the Bonga Hapo command, arrested them uh, early morning of uh, yesterday at a uh, so uh, where they've been hiding and after the time of uh, their arrest they were uh, in a Toyota CD bus uh, with registration number GT808610 and uh, the police even believes that uh, they might have snatched the bus from the owner uh, at a Shiamma. Now they are still in the custody of the police as the interrogation uh, continues. Now the information I'm picking uh, from the uh, headquarters, uh, that is the Bronga Hapo Regional Police Headquarters, uh, is that according to Puerku Bedu, uh, they were involved uh, in this particular uh, killing of uh, the uh, police constable, and uh, he has been involved in this criminal act for uh, some 10 years now, and uh, he confessed that uh, though he's involved in this, he has only been operating in the southern part of Ghana. Uh, so from the Bronga Hapo to the three other northern regions, uh, his operations does not uh, go to those uh, areas. And he also uh, told the police that uh, he's ready uh, to assist them in investigation in an attempt to apprehend all the uh, other guys that they've been working uh, with for all this number of years that they have been involved in this particular operation. A military officer in the Bnohafu region has also been arrested by the regional police command over his alleged involvement in the police recruitment scam. 58-year-old Francis Kunle, who is currently in police custody, was arrested in a crowd upon a tip-off by an applicant. Public relations officer of the regional police command, ASP Christopher Terrier, has been telling us more. An applicant of uh, Francis uh, Kunle who is a 58-year-old man and resides in Accra for major nearest Wutu. And he claims he's a military ex corporal who has been informing his prospective applicant to pay a huge sum of 2,000 Ghana cities to enable him to help them enter into the police training schools. And one of these applicants reported him to the National Headquarters, and then the National Headquarters also uh, referred the matter to the Bronga Apple Regional Police Command, since the applicant is in Bronga Apple Region, so that they can handle him well. And so, we did some uh, think operation, which allows that we should inform him on his own phone number that he gave to the African. So we called him, and immediately he made his driver to proceed to Bronga Hafo Region, Sunyani precisely, for the money. And uh, when he got there, he was arrested, but he said he was sent. So we have to take him to Accra, to the residence of uh, the S. Meriti Copra, uh, Francis Pullen, and they confess and we arrested him. Oh, today, for instance, they are preparing for court, maybe for uh, the court to remind him so that we can okay. get an ample time to do more investigation. Right, and we'll be bringing you much more on this uh, subsequently, but you're still watching News Today here on Joy News Multi TV. We're taking a break. We'll be back shortly with some more. Thanks for staying with us here on News Today. We can now do some more stories and let's stick with politics now. And Agri Minister Fifi Fiave Kwete has expressed optimism about his chances of retaining his seat as Member of Parliament for the Ketu South constituency. Now, speaking to correspondent Ivy Setoji after casting his ballot, Fifi Kwete said he's optimistic of winning with a comfortable margin despite suggestions by political watchers that the delay in conducting the polls may have an effect on the verdict. Uh, I'm confident that uh, uh, I would uh, I'll win. I'll win decisively. 
I'm confident that the people will uh, give me <laughs> what you call a massive endorsement in order to represent them again uh, for another four year term. So uh, I feel they, I mean, they, there's no cause for alarm at all. Yeah, and the, the, this year that the turnout might not be massive because of the delay and other stuff. And we are not, mm-hmm. we're in a festive season. Yeah. Other people, people have traveled to other places to mm-hmm. celebrate the Christmas and the New Year. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so, that's always a possibility. Uh, we would, so we, I mean, we've done uh, what we can in order to uh, make sure we do the proper announcement using radio, getting people to 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 go house to house. But generally, no matter what you do, you can exactly get the same turnout as if you were doing it together with uh, everybody. But uh, we are still hoping for the best. Yeah. Mm. Who do you see as a threat for this race? Uh, no, no threat at all. I'm confident that it will be it will be a one touch massive victory. Mm. Okay. Then up. After the primaries, you know there were issues before the exercise is coming off today. How do you intend to unite the party ranks and file? Uh, you know, every contest, democratic contest, brings uh, uh, situations like that. Uh, for me, what is most important is that we should understand that democracy, you win and then you lose. Uh, so people must have the democratic temper. Uh, you don't want to take part in a democratic contest if you don't have the temper I mean, for it. I mean, just like if you want to play football, you must appreciate that you sometimes win, sometimes you lose, other times you draw. And so having the temperament to stand by is important. Uh, my own approach at all moments is say, listen, uh, go on, go, let, let bygones be bygones. Let's get the latest on the elections in K2 South. And uh, joining me with an update is correspondent Ivy Setoji. So, Ivy, good afternoon. Uh, what's the situation now? The situation is that the election is generally calm, very peaceful. People are voting. Early in the morning, it was, um, the, the turnout was um, encouraging, but now um, many people are not coming out. But it's, it's very peaceful. Uh, people are just waiting that the winner be declared so that they can have their peace of mind because they have waited for far too long. So the situation is very calm. Uh, earlier, you did mention to us that uh, quite a number of people did turn up uh, hoping to cast the ballots, uh, seeing this particular election as uh, uh, a, a national general. one, a general yeah. election. Uh, is the situation uh, as, it, as, as it existed earlier? Uh, well, not that much like before. Now, everything is you know, like it, only a few people, especially those from the remote areas, who are uh, facing that problem. But the EC officials are resolving uh, the issue. I see. All right. Many thanks for that update. And uh, that was Volta Regional Correspondent Ivy Setoji bringing us an update on uh, the Ketu South elections. And if you uh, do not remember, like I said earlier, uh, this uh, the, the NDC primary is currently being held in the constituency because there was uh, an injunction earlier. But away from that, and nominations have opened for those wishing to lead the CPP into next year's elections to file their papers for consideration, aspirants are expected to pay 50,000 CDs as filing fees. Now, some of the CPP's presidential hopefuls, however, say the filing fees are a little bit on the high side. But party chairman, Professor Edmond Dele, says the CPP needs the money as it seeks to rebuild its structures for the 2016 polls. See, we are supposed to have at least two-thirds of our party offices in districts, no constituencies, and we worked out and found out that the minimum we need, minimum we need is about 150 party offices. The last time we collated it, we found out that we had about 50 offices. We haven't cross-checked the 50 to 60. It means that within the shortest possible time, we should get 100 offices acceptable by the Electoral Commission. And so I'm, I've set up a team who we'll rapidly go around. I did it before, and I'll do it again. Just go upper east, upper west, look at the offices, and then we find out how much it is, and then we pay for them. And we get yeah, the, the role that the presidential aspirants are playing in this, that's what we are interested in. No, no. They are making a contribution. Oh, and they're making a contribution. And as I'm how telling you, oh, they are going to make another 50,000 as their contribution for that. And some of them currently, they are going around campaigning, and they call me and tell me, oh, chairman, I've opened 10 offices here for the party. I've opened 25. In fact, I've asked my general secretary to sit down and collate that information. So besides that, 
there are also opening offices for us. So the presidential can yes. So, so let, let's get this clear. The presidential aspirants are paying fifty thousand cities each. You see. No, that's that's it, it's not the official one. A development fee. That's a development. How much are they paying to help the party open offices across the country? No, what I'm saying is the development fee. That would be fifty thousand. That has nothing to do with the filing fee we are talking of. You see, because we want them to contribute so that we do it. But we are not giving everything to them. In fact, I'm setting up a Ways and Means Committee and members of the Central Committee, we've told them that everybody should contribute. We are talking to our business friends, those who are businessmen, have sympathy for the CPP to make contributions. Uh, uh, is, is this compulsory? This uh, amount they are supposed to be compulsory, compulsory feature? Well, if you know, if you love your party, and you are coming to be a flag bearer of the party, and we are asking you to contribute. You contribute voluntarily. Because to be a president, when you become the executive president of Ghana, there is much in your hands. So this is the time to, and I have gone to talk to them personally that it is not that we are extorting money from you. We are just telling you that this is the state of the party. So kindly let us help to build the party. So to some extent, it's voluntary. It's voluntary, looking at the situation of our party. Well, to run is not a small money. You need a lot of money. But I'm confident that we'll make it because we have the goodwill from our supporters. And we also have goodwill from our members in the diaspora, in the U.S., in this one, who have given me letters. Even today I received one, said, Chairman, go ahead, let the election be, and we'll come and help you. And I can tell you categorically that we have people who have interest in the Convention People's Party. And they are prepared to support it, provided, first and foremost, the party itself is united. And that was National Chairman of the Convention People's Party, Professor Edmond Dele. You're still watching News Today here on Joy News Multi TV. We'll bring you business right after these messages. So time for some business on News Today. And Emmanuel Abouji, you have joined me now in studio with the very latest. Hi, Emmanuel. Hi. I'm so a lot again. more business stories, I suppose. Yes, Ghana is expecting more money. You know, we're still in the bailout, you know, and Ghana is expecting the third tranche of the bill okay. out come oh, next that, month. Oh, uh, that IMF thing, right? Sure, sure. Okay. The third tranche is expected to come next month. But I've still not month. seen... Okay, well, probably because I don't really focus so much on the economy, well, but... <laughs> well, we should we should wait and see. I mean, just mm. next month uh, is very, very close, and we'll see the outcome of that. Right, thank you. Give us more. All right, so in business, Ghana is likely to receive the third tranche of IMF funds before the end of next month. This will be influenced by the progress of the country um, the country has made so far under the IMF program. The IMF board is likely to endorse its tariff report when it meets on January 13, 2016. But will this really help stabilize the economy? There's more in this report. In 2016, where it is feared that the Ghana city could come under pressure again from January, then having a little over $116 million coming in from the IMF to support the country's import needs should be seen as critical. Again, for some economists, any positive comments from the IMF board on Ghana could convince the country's donor partners and investors that government is indeed on track with programs and policies to help stabilize the economy quickly in 2016. This could convince the rating agencies that the IMF stands ready to ensure that governments stick to targets set under the fund program, especially when it comes to cutting government's rise in expenditure and improving revenue collections. The development could also help release some private capital from outside that has been frozen because of concerns with the economy. But engaging some private investors in the country, they are still of the view that signing up to the IMF program by Ghana still not been able to address the uncertainty, the lack of confidence in the economy. Now moving on, the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, NPRA, has indicated plans to start transfers of second pension tier funds. 
to commence the transfers in November this year after some pension fund administrators successfully went through validation of data and due diligence on compliance processes. So far, 12 occupational pension schemes and 1,918 institutions, including some state ones, have benefited from the exercise. The beneficiary schemes also include Enterprise Tier 2 Occupational Pension Scheme with the highest number of 779 employers, followed by a Metropolitan Master Occupational Pension Scheme for 369 employers and then Petra Advantage Pension Scheme. Others include CEDA Pension Scheme operated by Access Pensions, Pensions Alliance Trust Fund and Secure Pensions Occupational Master Trust Scheme. The rest include those solely sponsored by specific employers namely ECG Tier 2 Pension Scheme, Goyal Occupational Pension Scheme, SNIT Second Tier Occupational Pension Scheme, Newmont Ghana Occupational Pension Scheme, Ecobank Ghana Limited Tier 2 Pension Fund fund and GPHA tier 2 pension scheme. The authority says it will resume their transfers after the Christmas and New Year break and therefore wants employers to yet to register their mandatory second tier occupational schemes to comply with the ongoing compulsory enrollment to qualify to receive the TPFA funds. Now, mineral water bottling firm Voltic has shut down one of its plants in the eastern region. The action has become influenced by recent quarry explosion in Paibo in the Nsaom Adwajiri district in the region. According to officials or sub Miller, owners of the company, the closure will, however, not affect production. The corporate and legal affairs manager, Adoba Chiama, tells Joy Business they are hoping to reopen the plant. As you are aware, we had a bit of damage from the explosion in the vicinity last week. Since then, we had to shut down the plan and do an assessment to ensure that the safety of our employees and uh, the security of our equipment was secured. So that has been done. We started cleaning up yesterday. And uh, we've been given the go-ahead to start operations again from today. So we'll start production. We will resume production later. And on her voice, we end this afternoon's edition of the Business News. Join us again at 7 p.m. for more business updates. Keep watching. And here's, uh, well, the goddess of entertainment, Gladys, you say, really. <laughs> a goddess, yeah, a goddess indeed. <laughs> yeah, indeed, I mean, you're full of entertainment. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, everything about you is entertaining. You're telling me. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what do we have in entertainment today? Of course, uh, Waisa is obviously in the news oh, with his apology song. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but uh, well, I, I, I would I, want to hear what you make of that one. And of mm. course, uh, we're also telling you about the top 50 celebrities who are most uh, followed on social media. Okay. And guess who is leading in Ghana? Yeah, in Ghana? Yes. I guess I could hear. Uh, well, unfortunately not. It is John Dumelo. Well, really? Let me tell you straight right. that right away. So John Dumelo leads 2015 top 50 Ghanaian celebrities on social media. The list of Ghana's top 50 celebrities with the highest following on social media has been released with the actor actually topping and that makes him the most popular Ghanaian entertainment icon on social media with over 1.2 million total number of weighted total of fans and followers on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. John DeMello stood head and shoulders above all other Ghanaian entertainment people with accounts on any or all three social media platforms. John DeMello also led the pack in terms of raw or unweighted total with 4,249,830 uh, and uh, you know they on all across three aforementioned social media platforms and so that makes John DeMello the most popular actor or celebrity in Ghana. Although he was not the leader in terms of most followed on Twitter and Instagram, his total haul of 3,290,531 of fans on Facebook alone contributed to pushing him to the top of the list. And the compilation which was done by my own Francis Doku, a columnist at Graphic Showbiz and a marketing communications practitioner, was to determine which Ghanaian entertainers, especially 
musicians, actors, comedians, radio and TV presenters had the most following on Twitter and Instagram as well as the most uh, fans on Facebook all together. It was also done to determine which of them had the largest following on each of the three platforms in 2015. I just wish that um, Francis had also included his own for us to see where he falls, uh, how much following he has on Facebook, especially because he is very active on Facebook. Well, let me also tell you about the hottest DJ in town, which was put together by Hit FM, our sister station. And well, the winner took home a DJ set. And guess what? He was so excited. Uh, he, he just couldn't hold back his excitement. So that'll be it for news today here on Joy News Multi TV. My name is Kwabena Chen Chen Hinebwating. There's more news on myjoyonline.com. Enjoy the rest of our broadcast.